I am delighted to see such a crowd. So, Falcher Wolver Fads, Mr. Tina, I am the development officer here at RSC Tanya. Um, and so pleased to have everybody here to celebrate International Women's Day 2022. Um, so we always make a point of, of celebrating women here in RSC Canada. It's at the core of all that we do. But um, yesterday and today and events like this are just a reminder and a chance to celebrate everything that women do, um, have done in the past, are doing in the present and, and certainly will do in the future. So um, thank you all for coming along. So this evening's talk with Dr. Myrtle Hill, uh, we'll look at the inspirational woman that was Mary Ann McCracken, a feminist, a social activist, an abolitionist and a general agitator. Um, she was a force to be reckoned with and was well ahead of her time um, in terms of the work that she was doing here, particularly in Belfast. Um, so I'd like to thank Margaret for coming along. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Margaret Ward. Um, Margaret was supposed to be with us here this evening and was by the dread of COVID um, at this unfortunately late stage in the game. So um, we'd like to send our best wishes to Margaret as well. Um, the second speaker this evening is another inspirational woman, also a feminist, social activist, agitator and community advocate, um, our Minister for Communities, um, Deirdre Hargey. Uh, so Deirdre will be discussing the legacy of Mary Ann uh, for women today and how important it is to have strong female role models um, for everyone here, for young women, for women who aren't so young anymore, for people in general and for the community. Um, as I say, past, present and future, they are integral um, to our world. So. Um, few last things then, um, just a bit of housekeeping, if you could check that all your phones are on silent or on mute or whatever way you want to do it, that we don't be interrupted this evening. Um, the fire exits are well marked, so if there's any, at any stage you need to use them, I mean, just follow the signs out down the stairs and to your left. Um, and finally, this event is part of our spring programme, our Clara and Yari in Shaw and Aris e Connelia. It's also part of Fela and Yari, um, and with both of those programmes there are loads of things happening. Um, so do have a look, all our events are on our website, on our social media um, and plenty happening uh, with Fiala as well. Our next event is actually this Saturday in here and it's Capitalism and the Climate Crisis uh, with Shemaine Mercier. So have a wee look at that and please do register if it would interest you. Um, so that's all for me. Uh, you yourself as an Ika, enjoy the evening. Thank you all again for coming um, and I'd like to hand this over now to you. Uh, for inviting me. First of all, I'm sorry to you that I'm not Margaret, uh, but I'm very happy for me to have had the opportunity to come here. Uh, it's great, and I hear from Margaret today that she's um, much recovered but still feeling very weak. So, again, I'd echo our best wishes to her. I could talk to you about so many inspirational women as a historian of women, they're just an endless list of those who have set. A wonderful example and paved the way for those of us here in the 21st century but I'm going back further uh, as is my remit for this evening to talk about Mary Ann McCracken. Mary Ann was born in Belfast on the 8th of July 1770 and died on the 26th of July 1866. Any exploration of these 96 years would reveal dramatic changes in social, economic and political life throughout Europe and beyond. Her life thus offers a unique insight into the transformations taking place. For this was no typical woman of the period, as we shall see when we look at the family into which she was born and whose attitudes and ideas helped to shape her character. The Joys and the McCrackens are names of historic significance in Belfast, of course, though that of Mary Ann, less notorious, less sensational, is not so much to the fore in our local or indeed our national historical narrative. Up until recently, John Gray, I thought, was one of the few concerned to highlight her consistently radical nature. And I would argue that Mary Ann's life, her concerns and endeavours, which were very much of her time, are also <coughs> partly relevant to our time, with both her character and her situation placing her at the very centre of the ideological maelstrom uh, which challenged the status quo. We need, first of all, to look at the influences uh, which surrounded her. And I've, uh, everybody, sorry. 
mixed up um, family tree here, but I think that this will give you an idea of where she comes from. Her mother, Anne Joy, came from a French Protestant Huguenot family which had made its money in the linen trade. Her Anne Joy's father, Francis Joy, was a lawyer who had founded the Belfast Newsletter uh, in uh, the first newspaper printed in a town whose growth made both the dissemination of noteworthy events and the details of trade and commerce particularly welcome. He went on to open a large paper mill in Ballymena and built a flax dressing mill in Randall's town. So her grandfather was a man of considerable local influence, also in touch with wider ideas, supporting, for example, uh, the American Revolution. Her uncles, Henry and Robert Joy, expanded the family business. Henry uh, was responsible for designing what is now the City Hall, uh, the White uh, Linen Hall, um, and the Poor House Building, sorry, the Poor House Building uh, was designed by Robert Joy. So they were very influential and Robert Joy was also involved in the first Belfast Volunteer uh, Company. So we've got lots of important things here uh, already. This is the, the obviously the Linen Hall, uh, ho sorry, the Poor House as it was first visited. Meanwhile, her, their sister Anne McCracken opened a milliner's shop in High Street, Belfast, fell in love with a dashing widower, as you do, a sea captain, John McCracken, Belfast ship owner and rope maker, an Ulster Scots Presbyterian who had expanded his family business concern so that they too were heavily involved in Muslim, cotton and rope works. Also, like most wealthy, wealthy industrialists, the family took the negative effects of growing urbanisation and industrialisation very seriously and were thus very much involved in charitable activities. So Mary Ann was born to very interesting parents who had considerable investment in many aspects of life in the growing time. She had a sister, Margaret, and four brothers, Francis William, Henry Joy, and John. She was particularly close to Henry, three years her senior. And brother and sister spent time visiting the poor, with Henry starting a Sunday school to teach literacy to poor children. They could be seen playing in the high street when not at school, where they were taught by a master uh, of innovation, David Manson, uh, whose motto was uh, to have a school where children would be taught to read and understand the English tongue without the discipline of the rod, by intermingling pleasurable and healthful ex exercise with their instruction. Very far-sighted uh, kind of syllabus, I think. Uh, it was a co-educational school. Um, it was undoubtedly an eccentric way of teaching at the time, but it undoubtedly instilled a love of learning and indeed gender equality unknown at the time. And Mary Ann was particularly fond of maths, figures and bookkeeping. And this unusual, indeed unique, educational experience, built on the wealth of influences emanating from the thorough engagement of her family in the world of 18th century Belfast. Not surprisingly then, there were frequent lively debates and discussions in the household. Family members not always in agreement, but even the growing children would have been aware of what was going on in the world. The American Revolution seemed relevant to industrialists, manufacturers and traders in Belfast. The aspirations of liberal, radical-minded individuals were greatly encouraged by the current Enlightenment ideas, the ideas around science, reason and logic, the radicalism of William Godwin, Mary Wollstonecraft's idea on education and female progress, and Tom Paine on the rights of man. All of these were seen as applicable to dissenters and Catholics, not to mention, who, oh, not many did, <coughs> women in Ireland. Bastille Day was greatly celebrated in Belfast, again not amongst absolutely everyone, and over the following years opinion changed as events uh, in France became more extreme uh, with the death of the King, war and imperialism. Radical ideas were also enhanced and indeed developed by the arrival in Belfast of like-minded individuals. Joining the McCrackens with the Joys, the Temples, and, the, and Bunting, uh, who was the, the harpist. Um, among others, there was the handsome Thomas Russell from Cork and Dublin lawyer Wolf Tone. During this whirlwind of excitement, the Society of United Irishmen was formed in 1791. 
focused on demands for political reform with the symbol of the harp reflecting the importance of Irish cultural roots. But let us return, uh, sorry, that's a wee odd bit that crept in there. As the sister of Henry Joy McCracken, who had, of course, a central role in the rebellion, that seems to be how she is best known. And she is often sort of just dismissed as being that kind of sister uh, by his side. However, she not only fully supported him in his political uh, activism, her letters to him when he was in Kilmainham jail reveal her close knowledge of the rebels and their daily plans, all of the specifics. She smuggled him money and food when he was in hiding after the Battle of Antrim. She ensured arms were not found in, the, in their home by herself, taking weapons uh, away. Uh, she arranged uh, for him to flee to America and following his arrest, attended his court-martial and accompanied him to the gallows, ensuring that a surgeon was on hand after his execution to unsuccessfully attempt to revive him. It's interesting in this area to consider her own views on women. She was not a member of the Female Society of United Irishmen herself. She didn't like the idea of segregating men and women. I think I put the quote up. Uh, as there can be no other reason for having them separate uh, but keeping the women in the dark. And certainly it is equally ungenerous and uncandid to make tools of them without confiding in them. I wish to know if they have any rational ideas of liberty and equality for themselves or whether they are contented with their present abject and dependent situation degraded by custom and education beneath the rank of society in which they were originally faced. For if we suppose woman was created for a companion for man, she must, of course, be his equal in understanding, as without equality of mind there can be no friendship, and without friendship there can be no happiness in society. It's a great quote when, when we talk about segregating uh, the genders. There are strong echoes of Wilsoncroft's uh, tone and language in Mary Ann's letters to her brother. Wilsoncroft's writings were advertised and reviewed in the Northern Star, and we know uh, that McCracken read her work. Wilsoncroft saw education as central to improving women's lot, decrying their female slavery. She urged them to throw off the fetters. Her views on the unequal status of the sexes was very clear with women seen as oppressed by their male partners. I think we get very interesting insights there to very important attitudes. Mary Ann herself uh, never married, though she did enjoy bringing up a child, taking in Henry's four-year-old illegitimate daughter, Maria, after his execution. And she lived uh, with Maria until her death. This, like the rebellion itself, was not well regarded within the wider family circle. She was also very close to Henry Joy's partners in rebellion, Samuel Neilston, Jemmy Hope, Thomas Russell, whose beauty she admired so enthusiastically, and who was executed following Emmett's failed uprising in 1803. Again, she did more than witness events. She helped Russell escape from Belfast to Dublin, paid for his legal defences, supported the families of the executed and the exiled. Most of all, she was important in treasuring their reputation writing their story, keeping records, and she appears to have been wholly in support of their actions and consistently uh, loyal to their ideals. But beyond that, her reforming principles were reflected throughout her life in wider activism. Um, I think it's fairly well known uh, her opposition to slavery, which felt, was felt blighted all of humanity and not just in America but was also facilitated, directly or indirectly, by the trading ships which anchored in the expanding port of Belfast. Thomas Russell was one of those who opposed that horrific uh, trade, excuse me, uh, which per creates and perpetuates barbarism and misery. While in 1792, the owner of the newsletter, Henry Joy, offered a toast to Mr. Wilberforce, 
and Samuel Nielsen hosted the African slave, Alwida Equiano, uh, who stared at Clifton House, uh, sorry, who spoke at Clifton House and told and sold the story of his experiences. Mary Ann was bound to have been amongst those supporting him and had been a founding member of the Ladies' Anti-Slavery Association. This would be a long-running campaign throughout her life, with protests stimulated in December 1845 by the visit of another freed American slave, the writer and campaigner, Frederick Douglass, who addressed large crowds. Reverend Isaac Nelson led Belfast's vibrant anti-slavery league, and Mary Ann McCracken's name is listed among the committee members on their address to the Ladies of Ulster in 1846. Indeed, well into her 80s, she was seen handing out leaflets against the practice of slavery at the docks of Belfast. So, real consistency in her commitment there. No doubt, she also proudly displayed one of the many pieces of jewellery expressing her anti-slavery views with a powerful motto inscribed on it, Am I not a man and a brother? And alongside this searching question, the portrayal of a chained and kneeling African slave. That's an absolutely powerful uh, little image. <coughs> Mary Ann was also busy addressing issues in poverty, of poverty and exploitation closer to home, putting her ethical and moral views to practical use. In the early 1800s, when she and her sister Margaret opened a Muslim manufacturing business in Belfast, she revealed not just a good business mind, but more unusually, a very real concern for the welfare of her workers. A letter to the Belfast newsletter in 1803, attributed to her, contained tips for factory owners, including um, the, the premises ought to be clean, and workers ought to be provided with warm coats and clothes, so as to be protected against the evil effects of wet and cold when going to and returning from their work. Sufficient time should be allowed for amusement in the open air during fine weather, especially after the dinner hour um, uh, break. So proprietors and manufacturers uh, should have responsibility. Uh, and you can see here, uh, there is a kind of obviously paternalistic or maternalistic uh, aspect to all of this. Um, nonetheless, uh, she was ahead of her uh, com contemporaries in the area of industrialization. Uh, ideas only beginning to be muted elsewhere um, by Owen, uh, for example. She was interested in the new means of production, <coughs> seeing mechanism as helping to end drudgery, drudgery and exploitation. From her earliest childhood, and I'll just put up here some of the things she was involved in. Uh, she had worked to raise funds and provide clothes for the children of Belfast Poorhouse, now Clifton House. Uh, she retained a particularly keen interest in its affairs, an interest given a significant boost following a visit uh, to Belfast from ardent social reformer Elizabeth Fry in 1827. Reform was very much needed in the overcrowded Poorhouse. The large number of inhabitants reflecting local poverty, fever and industrial decline. A ladies committee had been formed in 1814 to oversee the situation of female residents, uh, but male disinterest rendered it largely ineffective. Fry's visit and the interest to which it gave rise proved a powerful motivation. A new ladies committee was introduced in 1827, of which McCracken was first treasurer and then secretary from 1830 to 1855. Um, her emphasis in, in the poor house being on updating the terrible conditions on providing care and instruction uh, to enable young people moving on from there uh, to be able to <coughs> earn a living. And those principles we heard earlier of fresh air and stimulation were also applied to the infant school for orphans which she opened in 1830, again defying male opposition, you need to take the children outside to play. Um, she insisted, with equipment supply, we need to broaden their horizons. There is, of course, a broader context to this, uh, with a new kind of welfare regi regime slowly beginning uh, to come into place, uh, with infant schools uh, ending um, within, by the mid-century. 
and the Ladies' Committee minutes also come to an end in 1851. During periods of decline in the fluctuating textile industry, in times of fever and famine, her commitment to the poor was always evident. Involved in the Society for the Relief of the Destitute Sick, a member of the Belfast Ladies' Clothing Society, which provided blankets and clothes during the famine, on a committee to prevent uh, the employment of uh, chimney climbing boys, and a member of the, the uh, Belfast Workhouse Committee and the Ladies' Industrial School. Now, many of those activities can be said to be very typical of middle-class female life in the 19th century, charity and philanthropy. Although we had seen, like many of us, her younger years revealed a more radical slant, coinciding with the tumult of ideas leading to revolution and rebellion. Her family and her education gave her the freedom to express her ideas, as did her own nature. She was proactive, intelligent, well-read, and put ideas into practice, which is the more unusual bit, I think. To actively participate in smuggling men around the country demonstrated her independence, certainly of spirit, but also facilitated her business life and her ability to bring innovative leadership to her charity work. Catching bronchitis in 1865, she's now buried in Clifton Street in the shadow of the poor house. Overall, her life was marked by the characteristics of consistence, determination and loyalty, particularly uh, to the United Irish men uh, and their memory. She assisted R.R. Assisted R. R. Madden in writing the seven volume corpus, The United Irish Men, Their Life and Times, to which historians owe a great deal. Their continuing reputation owes much to her memories and input. <coughs> but all her causes were focused on one ideal, to ease the suffering of the poor and the oppressed. Motivated by strong religious belief and also by confidence in the validity and rightness of her cause, she was a woman at the very heart of the reforming spirit of Belfast from the 18th century until her death. What would she think about our current situation? The ever-growing gap between rich and poor, the continuation of slavery and exploitation, disputed borders, imperialist ambitions and nationalist struggles. Mary Ann McCracken campaigning for equality for men and women, for education, for the rights of workers, help for the poorest, and most exploited in society, I suggest that she is the perfect role model for our times. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Virgil. I'm sure you'll all agree you have an absolutely fascinating insight into um, an incredible woman. Um, so I would like to introduce you now, if you just want to give another clap, for our Minister for Communities, Deirdre Harvey. Thanks very much, Fiona. I suppose, firstly, just thank you to the organisers just for, firstly, organising tonight's event in the midst of International Women's Day and Week, and as you say, as part of Fiona and Yari, which has taken place um, as well. And again, I just want to thank Myrtle, obviously, just for that fascinating and insightful history and run through of the life of Mary Ann. And indeed, to pass on my regards to Margaret, um, who is unwell and uh, couldn't be here this evening. And again, just like Myrtle, I want to, I suppose, pay um, some gratitude as well to John Gray for his invaluable contribution. I've been listening to some of the discussions and contributions and study that John has done in his lifetime as well. And I think that work, the work that Myrtle and Margaret's doing, is really important um, that we keep that history, that we bring it to life, that we look at the impacts of it, um, and that it has today in terms of shaping where we're going to go in the time ahead. So just to really say that we're indebted for all of the work um, of our historians and, and those who actually, through their own activism, bring that to life as well. I suppose when you look at Mary Ann McCracken, as was said, she was a daughter of the Enlightenment and a child of the Age of Revolutions. And while the tide of the Atlantic Revolutions in America, France, Haiti, and here in Ireland may have defined her youth, the flow of the Industrial Revolution 
would define how Belfast was to evolve for the remainder of her life. And indeed Belfast today is very much the product of all of these processes and the actions of Mary Ann and indeed her family. I'm very conscious of her legacy in my own community of the market area in South Belfast and in our city working class community. <coughs> where um, at the area southern boundary, her maternal uncles had a paper mill on what is now Ormo Avenue and gave the name to what is Joy Street where Joy's paper mill would have set. While in the north of the city, somewhere in the vicinity around Oxford Street and May Street, Francis Joseph Bigger noted the existence of a felon's plot and an unmarked grave of several United Irishmen who were executed alongside Henry Joy and who Jimmy Hope, a great friend of the McCracken family, would later immortalise in a verse in his poem McCracken's Ghost. While Story lay martyred and Dickie lay dead and the hands of the oppressors on spikes placed their heads, their spurts in glory triumphed to the skies and proclaimed through that hour the croppies would rise. And it did you can't walk in many places in this city without the influence of Mary Ann and indeed her family and those who she worked with as well. I drove up here tonight um, through Donegal Pass and again that was her uh, home at 62 Donegal Pass and we've seen the blue plaque that was put up by the Ulster History Circle. So indeed their influence, not just in their activism and work, um, it's felt very much on the streets of this city as well. And indeed another of McCracken's family project was the Belfast Heart Festival and the work of Edward Bunting was kept alive from 1809 to 1839 by a harp and language school, which again was based in the community that I come from at 21 Crummick Street. And indeed, Myrtle touched on this in terms of often Mary Anna's viewed through the prism of her brother and very much seen in the shadow of her brother. But the historian Jim Smith um, has stated that Mary Ann was by any measure a remarkable woman who lived out her long independent life in the best commercial, charitable and philanthropic traditions of the Joy and McCracken families. And for too long, Mary Ann's story has only been told in relation to that of her brother and the other men in her life. But as John Gray points out, those uh, as determined a revolutionary in her own right, and in some ways here too male dominated historical narratives, is reflected in a tendency by us all to prioritize dramatic and glamorous episodes and historical records, such as elections and executions, rebellions and referendums, instead of really looking at what's happening below those um, historical events, the slow, patient activism that leads to them. And I think in examining Mary Ann's legacy, her patient commitment and determination to the cause of progress is one of the main lessons which we can all draw inspiration from today. And in his study of liberal tradition and the political thought, the late Italian philosopher Domenico Lucerto noted that from its inception, liberalism was predicated on the active exclusion of three groups, women, workers, and the colonized. And in our life's work, we see that each of these were causes of Mary Ann and causes that she held dear. Be that in her work with the Belfast Charitable Society to ensure that uh, the indignant children were educated, her support for the education of girls, or her lifelong struggle against slavery that was demonstrated earlier. Another important lesson for us to draw from these is the unity of struggle. Mary Ann didn't see these as separate and distinct forms of oppression, but she drew parallel to each of them, writing to her brother in 1797, that there can be no argument produced in favour of the slavery of women that has not been used in favour of general slavery. And likewise, in 1799, uh, she wrote to her cousin that a wonderful clamour is now raised in the name of union, when in reality there has always been such a union between England and this country, as there is between husband and wife, by which the former has the right to oppress the other. Mm. And in many ways, while progress has undoubtedly been made in each of the causes that Mary Ann and herself dedicated her life, 
much work remains to be done today. Recent years demonstrate whether it's in the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent Black Lives Matter protests, or the killing of Sarah Everard, and the subsequent police brutality towards women demonstrating in solidarity with her, how much progress needs to be made still. John Gray noted that it seems obvious to us today that Mary Ann was on the right side of history, and thus she can be made very easily co-opted by all sides as a model of female pioneer. What we forget was how far ahead in her times that she was, and how she had to struggle always, struggle against the odds. Her story should accordingly lend itself to the new generations well in the fight for a better society, however daunting that task may be. And I think it is important to point out and to emphasize that while it's always inadvisable to try and ascribe modern perspectives to historical figures, we can, by examining their lives and their works, draw certain conclusions. And indeed, the German philosopher Walter Benjamin warned that a danger affects both the content and tradition of its receivers. The same threat hangs over both that of becoming a tool of the ruling class. In every era, the attempt must be made anew to wrest tradition away from the conformism that is about to overpower it. The threat of Mary Ann is that the years to the apologists of slavery, supremacy, exclusion and oppression in her day seek to sanitize her to such a degree that her legacy becomes innocuous to power and privilege. This is another form of struggle and she was well aware herself when she collaborated with the historian R.R. Madden of his work on the United Irishmen. And in her postmodern age, when the very idea of progress is called into question, I think of the quiet, consistent dedication of Mary Ann for decades in one of her most inspiring legacies. And in terms of that, um, I'll leave you with a quote from Frederick Douglass, a contemporary of Mary Ann's and a comrade in struggle against slavery, something that she fought long and hard for. And he said, let me give you a word of the philosophy of reform. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born of earnest struggle. The conflict has been exciting, agitating, all absorbing for the time being, putting all other tokens to silence. It must do this or it does nothing. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favour freedom and yet depreciate, agitate our men who want crops without ploughing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. And I suppose I just want to leave on the point, um, is that issue that we do all have a role to play, no matter what that is. And for me, what really stands out about the life of Mary Ann is her slow and patient activism, her ability to organize, to agitate, to have that continuous build of work um, that she done throughout her 96 years um, on this earth. And I think for activists today, when you look at campaigns around language rights, around women's rights, around disability rights and minority rights, it is that activism at the grassroots. It's that slow burner over time that really starts to create that radical and revolutionary change and key events that happen on our streets um, and across our countries globally. So again, I would call on everyone is to continue to be an activist, to continue to organize, continue to agitate, because your actions and the actions of others will lead to that radical change that Mary Ann sought to achieve, and indeed that many of those human rights and community activists want to achieve today. So far, you know.
um, on Merkel as well. So one of the things that we always try and do here at RSC Conde is tie in the past with the present. Um, obviously, given the nature of, of, of why we're here, um, it's about making it relevant to people today and about informing people and, and allowing them to, to, I suppose, tie it into their own lives and why it's important to them. Um, and I think International Women's Day, as I mentioned, is the ideal time to look at somebody like Mary Ann. So I'm going to invite Deirdre and Myrtle up um, to the, the, the front here. Um, I hope you can see if I'm up to stand, <laughs> they're all going to look really awkward. Um, and we'll, I, I, want, I have a few questions for them and then we'll open it up to the audience. So for the only second here. <laughs> So I have a question each and then we'll, we'll, op we'll open it up. Um, uh, I'll start um, Deirdre with you just about Miriam because we had, we had spoke, or you spoke there um, about how often, and, and, and Mark, you, you addressed it as well, how often we hear about Miriam in the context of Henry Joy. You know, if you try to describe, it to, describe her to somebody, you'd often hear Henry Joy McCracken's sister. Where did you first uh, hear about Miriam or what sort of context did, did you remember hearing about her? And, I didn't realise that the market and all was so, so tied in. <laughs> but um, yeah, where, where did you kind of hear about together? They grew up in a political family as well. So when you look at Mary Ann and they say that she grew up in a very political family in terms of her parents, her brothers and indeed her other siblings. I grew up in a similar family. Um, my mommy and daddy were both active in civil rights. They're Republican activists. They're community activists as well. So. Um, I suppose the works, my daddy was an internationalist um, also, so a lot of the reading and works of Mary Ann and others were always in our house, um, was always talked about by my daddy and my mommy. So I grew up on the stories that my daddy would have um, had passed down to him from his parents and his, he always talked about an uncle who was a communist. Um, and I suppose that's where my influence as I got a bit older and growing up in the market in an inner city community. Um, obviously we had tours of Clifton House and, and looking at the impact in Clifton Cemetery um, where she's buried and obviously the story of Henry Joy. So I mean that would have been brought to the fore um, the most. It was the meeting place where he was hung. My mum says that she met my daddy. Um, I don't know what that is, but, um, <laughs> romance. <laughs> growing up in the market as well, um, you know the fact that there was Joy Street. Um, we were very much as a community activist living there and working there, very much into the history of where we've come from as an inner city working class community, and discovering then the connections of these historical figures who actually then walk the streets of the community that I live in um, today. And I suppose that really brought it to light. And most recently, was I was in Belfast City Council for 10 years as a councillor. Um, and always when you heard of Mary Ann, there's a busk offer, the only kind of display offer in that building. Um, and when you think of the history of her family and the first, um, uh, I suppose, council building that was there before, that was the busk was upstairs out of public view and kind of hidden away. And there was a lot of work that was done in the council in terms of um, looking at the history of the building um, and that all of the history wasn't represented when you walk through the building and particularly from a, a female perspective as well. And we've done a, a task of work of trying to look at rebalancing that history and writing those stories back in um, to the point then that hope soon enough Belfast City Hall will have a statue of Mary Ann McCracken along with Winifred Carney and others out on the front lawns of the building um, and to give her a red book. Um, that, that's, that's amazing. And Myrtle, in your own, Myrtle and I were talking just, just before this began and um, we were, you were saying about how um, you're doing a lot of sort of community talks and stuff. In terms of, I suppose, that academic world and then your experience within the community, do you find that more people are asking questions or that more people are aware now of people like Mary Ann McCracken uh, maybe in the last decade or so? Do you think there's been a shift there? I think there has been a little. Um, I mean, my own background, nothing uh, like yours. I didn't come from a political family, very much a working class, prod uh, family, um, and indeed became uh, an academic as a mature student. Yeah. And all of that 
before I started studying women's history and then became very feminist. So I was very late to everything. Okay, <laughs> So I missed an awful lot of the um, things that went on in, say, the early 70s and so forth. I was later to it. There are some advantages to that, I think. Um, but I, I always felt very apologetic about it. And people said, well, it was like, what did you do in the morning? <laughs> uh, I, I minded lots of children. But um, it was through that academic work and through history, through looking at, um, and particularly I was asked very early on to do uh, a, a history of women in Europe kind of thing. Uh, with that remit, just from whenever to whenever, just women in Europe, you know. Uh, and, no history absolutely, there, you, know? <laughs> you know. And I learned loads of stuff, of course, and that really impacted very strongly uh, on me, along with finding the interests of friends and colleagues, of course, who have been fortunate enough to have been uh, involved with very inspirational people, but particularly in looking at the history of ideas, which always fascinated me. So I would be looking at um, you know, the ideas of the Enlightenment, the lead up to the French Revolution. Mary uh, uh, Wollstonecraft always fascinated me. And as time went on, and I became much more engaged with women's history and social history and, and so forth, uh, and then I became uh, really uh, much more specialist in Irish women's history, uh, and Mary Wollstonecraft, um, when I sort of started looking just vaguely uh, at her, knowing nothing other than she was Henry Joyce's um, sister, uh, I was really struck by the similarities uh, in the language and in the tone and the ideas of Wollstonecraft. Now, I did a talk last year sometime, uh, I think it was the Linen Hall, asked me to look at Wollstonecraft's uh, influence uh, on her and I thought oh, they were such different women. I oh, how could you do that? One was very religious and one was not and all this sort of stuff. But it was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. On the surface we may see people as very different, but it's in those strongly held beliefs. Uh, there may be different ways of expressing them. Uh, but they're there. Anyway, this isn't answering your question. <laughs> um, it's totally even when I was at Queen's, um, but now uh, much more since I've retired, I've always taught uh, out in the community, uh, starting in uh, Father Des's uh, house and, and Conway Mill and so forth. But now I, uh, that's what I like doing. I was a mature student. I only want to talk to people who want to be there. You know, who aren't forced there by their mommy and daddy and resent you uh, for that, you know. So I love that and I'm very fortunate that I can now spend my time um, doing a lot of that. And the interest is great. And what I think we're seeing is the building up. I remember interviewing uh, Linda Walker uh, and asking her what she thought was the greatest achievement of second wave feminism, the women's movement uh, in Belfast. And I think she was absolutely right. It was the opening of women's centres. And look at how that has grown and swollen into all kinds of areas and places. And look how those women, so many of them, have moved on, you know? Uh, and they now are wanting to know these things. So I, I think it is all built from that. Um, but yes, certainly. Recently, I have noticed uh, an interesting difference is that sort of always um, taught on the Falls Road and indeed on the Shankill Road. Uh, I'm involved in the centre down the way. Um, but I never get talking in my own place, um, which is a prod housing estate, basically. Uh, and I have been lately. And I've been over in East Belfast and talking to women there and indeed having joint meetings. Mm -hmm. So that has risen much more. I think West Belfast was much quicker in grasping the need for an education and the need uh, to know more um, about our past. And I now think that um, other areas of Belfast, uh, equally sort of embedded in their own history, are now accepting that need to, you know, not just challenge it, but to learn more about other aspects mm -hmm. of our history. So that side, I think, is, is new. That's what I've noticed changing in the last couple of years. Um, and I agree, you've both touched on it, that none of this 
is in silo. It's all very much interlinked and, and across mm -hmm. communities and, and across the city. Um, and, and some of the, the people and the pioneers of that, um, I know, are, are sitting in this room tonight. So um, a huge, a huge thank you to, to them um, for making things like this possible. Are there any questions? If you just raise your hand, are there any questions from the audience or comments? Um, looking at Mary Ann's uh, family tree, it looks as though she came from money. Did she? Were they wealthy? And if so, how did that affect her work with working class people? Did they view her as somebody who, who was not of their like, or did it not matter to her at all? I'm going to repeat the question, just uh, we are recording this. So uh, the question was about Mary Ann coming from a family um, with money and being viewed, I suppose, as a, as, a middle, as a middle class, you know, wealthy female. Did that impact on her work with, with working class communities? Um, I think it's uh, her, she had such empathy um, with her own wider community of workers and so forth. Um, there's no doubt that the McCrackens and the Joys and so forth were very influential families and there was obviously money there as we can see. But now whenever she and her sister opened that um, Muslim factory they did get into difficulties yeah. uh, and they had to close it down at various times. So she was very clear about the impact of those uh, textile fluctuations on her workers and indeed there were times when they kept the workers on even though yeah. you know there, there wasn't sufficient work for them and so forth um, and I think she lived a fairly modest um, life what I think is interesting it's not quite the same thing but uh, what I think marks her out in, in looking at women I've looked at a whole variety of women over the 18th and 19th centuries is when they got married you lost them from the various committees and minutes and so forth. Not all of them, have one or two great exceptions. But um, Mary Ann never married. And I find that those who didn't were able, because they didn't have to defy the conventions of matrimony, mm -hmm. um, were able to really keep on acting on their own initiative. But I don't think she was wealthy as such. Uh, I think she was independent in all ways. <laughs> it's not something I've looked closely at. I, I don't know what her accounts were like, but I do not get the impression um, she moved around sort of various parts of central Belfast there. Um, I, I suppose sort of lower middle class, maybe I would describe her as, although it's very difficult to use that kind of, of definition. Um, but certainly, say it's i find it a bit difficult because because it's awful paternalistic this you know you need to do this that and the other but she really was far ahead um of others in knowing that you know it's the workers who are bringing you uh whatever they're bringing it's they who are contributing to society uh and so forth but it's a very good question i have the same one with some of my other women um who i've looked at and people are saying now were they wealthy or were they not wealthy? Um, and a lot of them spent a lot of their money on the causes that they were involved in as well. Yeah, I have loved your talk, Merle. Um, and I want to ask Deirdre a question. I loved your talk, Deirdre. And um, what I really appreciated was hearing you say that you know, revolutions, change, rebellions, political action is preceded by hundreds of people doing things that don't get noticed. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking, I was thinking, I know loads of Mary Ann McCrackens mm -hmm. in my lifetime. I'm related to some of them. And I felt that what you're talking about in terms of activism, um, sometimes activism is in the home. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be public, but to give us that sense that what we do matters in our lives, and sometimes small things, hopeless things. You know, I remember us having classes in the mill whenever, um, whenever the mill was subject to political vetting, mm -hmm. and feeling absolutely hopeless at times about change. Mm -hmm. And it's just so important to be reminded. Mm -hmm. um, of what you're saying. I'm sorry this is so long. No, not and, at all. And you're not getting the sound. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't have to repeat any of it. No. I, would just, I would just like to ask you, Deirdre, from where you're standing at the moment, how you see the work that's going on that you're hearing Merle talking about, how you see that 
polymath in the future, how you see the influence of that in our future. So just, just to, to, to paraphrase what, what Agnes said, she was saying that there, are so much, there is so much work that goes on behind the scenes, as Deirdre referred to, so much of it thankless often, um, and, and sometimes you feel a bit hopeless and as if you're, you're trying to fight the tide, um, but actually that the revolution and rebellion is, is, is often a culmination of those things. Um, and I guess you, you're one of those people who, who I know within, within the community, particularly here locally, um, fought against the tide for a long time and, and have seen it develop into something. So she's asking Deirdre how she sees that panning out um, in, her own, in her own work. Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, Mary Alma Crackens and others like her um, still exist in our communities, work day in, day out in our communities. Um, and just for me growing up, I mean, my biggest influence has been my mommy mm -hmm. in terms of the role that she played within the home, looking after my daddy who was ill after getting a beating during the conflict. And um, she raised seven children um, in that home as well, and obviously had her own history in terms of you know uh, where she came from she'd lost children and stuff as well and then as i grew up in the market i mean it was the day-to-day -day work of joining a local camogie team being involved in um, a young women's group which was run by the city council at the time and then wanting to be a shadow volunteer thinking at 13 we were big girls and we wanted to <laughs> manage the summer scheme and help out and that's really where my activism had come from and at the same time my daddy, along with others in the area, um, had established the residence group back in 1994 when I was 14. I joined that at 16. And I mean, so that's been the biggest influences on my life are those people that I worked with day in, day out on campaigns in the community um, that I lived in. And there are hundreds, if not thousands of people that have been doing those small pieces of work. And I suppose in my, you know, when you look back in history, it's easy just to look at the big events because that's mm -hmm. what's recorded, that's what's written down, that's what you look at. And normally it's events that represent in terms of the role of men and very often not the role of women. And that, that was always something for me when you looked at the, the memorabilia and the work that we done within council. And this was all parties in council that were involved. Because when you walked around the building, it's not that women weren't partaking in events in the city. You know, um, and our history is layered and complex, and that's, um, I suppose, the really interesting thing. You know, you had the Ulster Covenant, you had the 1916 rising, um, and for every event, there was a, a reaction, you know, to that in terms of looking through. But the stuff that we uncovered um, was the layers and complexities below those big historic events. What else was happening that led up to those events that were the legacy after those events? So when you look at things like the Ulster Covenant, like more women say the Ulster Covenant, but they say the separate covenant. They couldn't say the same covenant um, as the men, um, yet there were more women who signed up. So just unearthing histories like that. Um, and when you look at the role, obviously, of um, women in terms of the lead up to the 1916 rising, you look at the leaders who were executed who were men. Um, and it's often men who write that history. But you forget about all of the actions that led up to that um, and who were involved and what was happening within the community and at the grassroots that led to change around those key events. So for me, activism is critical. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're playing your part in the home, um, if you're playing it out in the community, if you're in a school environment, the education. I mean, one of my early was the Ulster People's College mm -hmm. um, and the impact and influence that that had in terms of community education for me and for especially women mm -hmm. in the market where I lived. Um, and it's that slow burning. I mean, that was the thing around Mary Ann, you know, she just threw out her 96 years. Um, and for the majority, it was just every day. She just worked away, chipped away um, and had a really key role. I'm sure, I mean, she completely influenced her brother um, and those other leaders that would have taken place. And obviously international events um, had an impact on her as well around the French Revolution, the American Revolutions, what was happening in Haiti in terms of the emancipation of, of black people and stuff as well. So um, it's looking at all of those and no matter how small your part is, you have a part to play in terms of a bigger struggle um, and the change that you're creating. So that's why for me, um, it's that activism on the ground. That's something I'm really passionate about because that creates change. It definitely does, and whether that's at a small neighbourhood and city level, 
something more globally when you look at the challenges around racism, climate, war, um, destitution. Um, things don't happen without those actions um, at a local level and for me it's just looking at it from both ends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Yeah. yeah I, I just wanted to ask them, it's a question to both of you, right? I mean, Mary Ann McCracken was an inspirational figure. She was obviously got her inspiration from the people she talked to, the people she grew up with and she, make, she mixed with. How does this generation get it of young women? Do you know what I mean? If they're not involved in a community association or, or anything like that, how do they get... Um, close to an inspirational figure who can give them the drive to, to do the sort of things that Mary Ann McCracken did. So just for, for, for anyone um, on, on, on the camera, um, this lady's asking, Mary Ann was such an influential figure and was so influenced by the people around her. Yes. Um, and how do young women now uh, be influenced and, and find direction and steer and encouragement yes. from the people around them? I think, I think it's the encouragement. It, yeah. it requires somebody to, to light a spark how, how, how can that be done better? Well, with me, it was um, education did it for me, yeah. you know. Uh, I mean, Mary Ann was the first female member uh, of the Lynn Hall Library, and she read widely. Uh, and those ideas that were around at the time, well, they were around for everybody, but not everybody read them, analysed them, assessed them, took them on board. Uh, and for me, education did it. I say my background uh, was very different from, from many others. Uh, but as I learned about the women, for me it was the women uh, of the past as well as those with whom I was surrounded. Because when I became involved in community education, I found myself working with and alongside and for terrific people, male and female, who inspired me uh, to keep on going. But being a historian of women's, I found it was a bit like being a detective, you know. You had to hunt out things and take a name and go from here to there and all the rest of it. Um, and we are fighting always against, and I think this is linked to your question, um, we're fighting against the history that we're given, mm -hmm. as we've all referred to. And a book has come out recently uh, um, on... Um, uh, Women in the Irish Revolution, I think it's called, edited by Linda Connolly, I think. And I reviewed it, and honestly, um, you know, it's a hard read and it's an uncomfortable read because women too are doing things that are, you know, um, are done in the name of war, conflict and so forth. But it showed, you know, we all know that the story we're given, the narrative, isn't quite right because it has excluded women. But I found that by the time I came to the end of that book and its very contributions, that it showed you step by step, almost, how that narrative was constructed. Why it was that women's voices were left out at different times. So it's new archives being opened that are telling a very different story. Um, so anyway, for me, it came um, from history and from people around me. Uh, I was saying earlier today that I have been so impressed in the midst of the horror of watching the news in this past couple of weeks by women from uh, the UN, from NATO, uh, from uh, all sorts of international organisations and how they speak out, um, their commitment, their uh, emotion, uh, their they're just brilliant, I think, you know. Uh, and so I think great strides have been made there. Um, my own personal influence came from uh, Margaret McCurtain, uh, but, and that was about how that person was and how she was made up. Um, it came from her exploration of women's history, amongst other things. Uh, and uh, she inspired me to keep going when I thought I wouldn't uh, and other people have done the same so I think there are people out there there are people in this room uh, there are people everywhere who are speaking out and I'm lucky enough to be uh, friends with some and to have some as my colleagues um, such as Margaret uh, such as Eilish you know many many people who are out there doing it 
Uh, for me, the particular path that I've taken uh, means that I, I want to do it through educate. Well, the only way I can do it really is through through history, through education, through showing why we are where we are, and then maybe we can go on to how we can change that. You know, sorry, very long winded. Uh, <laughs> Not I know. At all. Um, and Deirdre, you say something about that? That, that lady's um, daughter who's sitting beside her is my boss. And I know um, and we're, we're all colleagues here, and I know it's only a small thing, but we're all sure start workers. Um, I mean, and we're working with the children from the very, very young. And hopefully, we have a great influence in their parents and their the, their mummies, you know, in everything that we, we do. Yep. So I think sometimes it really is starting from the very beginning. And I think everybody's beginning is actually different than I think you've, you've highlighted mm -hmm. that, you know, some people it is at that young age and some people start a wee bit, a wee bit later in the game and, and each way is, is, is perfectly fine. Yeah. Do, do you want to be yourself or, no, or do you well, think that in three steps? It can start very much from the cradle. I mean, mm -hmm. you're right in terms of the influence um, of you growing up. Um, I mean, as I say, I came from a very political family, a family that were active. Not everybody else grows up in that environment and people come from different environments, but I suppose it, it I mean, education is key. There's mm -hmm. no doubt in trying to um, have that education, not to say I finished mine, as Elish knows, I dropped out um, <laughs> in terms of education and I don't have the best. I suppose my education is community education that I would have come up in and the kind of structures that were there within the market where I live um, that allowed me to get involved in a camogie club that allowed me to get involved in a young women's group that led me to be a, a volunteer in summer schemes that then led me to join the residence group and become a community activist. And then it was the education that I would have got through that in the likes of the Ulster People's College um, and doing cross community work, um, doing reconciliation work and stuff as well. That kind of, so it's that life experience that I gained. So the big thing is how we can create them opportunities for other women and girls that are coming up making sure that they do have that space to figure out who they are and what they want in life. And I mean, education's key to that in terms of having all of the information, <coughs> having critical thought to think about things, to challenge things, to disagree um, or agree mm -hmm. when you want to and really having the freedom and for that to be encouraged. Um, you know, that it's not just something that's mm -hmm. passed down, um, albeit that's, that history is important but that you can critically analyze and, and challenge. I think it's also important in getting the community to encourage that type of thought. Mm -hmm. So community education, community structures, um, I think what you can do within the family and in the home, do you know, because that is the real important um, part, um, notwithstanding the challenges, you know, mm -hmm. raising children and being a parent and um, doing all of that as well. I think I'll be like Mariana, I'll never marry, never have children, but that's great. Um, so it's doing all of those things, um, and that's been kind of my influence. Growing up, I've been lucky, um, and people drop out and join at different times, but I mean, we do have a very active, I mean, a lot of the campaigns, when you look at it now, around language rights, um, around uh, women's rights, around climate, is young girls. I mean, it's young people generally that are leading those campaigns, that are taken to the streets, that are agitating the change, that are doing the petitions, that are using technology that we we'll have now um, to really agitate and to keep things going. And I suppose that gives me heart. The other thing, I suppose, is the ability to write and record our history. So I always think that's important too, because like a generation, or when you're looking at Mary Ann's time, that ability to write and to keep the history albeit women are often written out of it. Mm -hmm. But with technology and stuff now, we just need to find ways of making sure that we're retaining the history, that we are writing women and other groupings back into the history, and that you're telling it from each of our own perspectives. Mm -hmm. Do you know, because our histories are layered and complex. It doesn't run in straight lines, as we know. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that's what makes it fascinating and more enticing to, to look at, and particularly to learn from going forward. Mm -hmm. Just to, to add on, on that point, I think the introduction of local history yeah, into the yeah. syllabus mm -hmm. has been yeah. really important because mm -hmm. kids then see it as relevant, not yeah. when I was learning about Tudor Kings. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Well, firstly, 
Thank you so much, Starfield and Myrtle. That's been a fascinating conversation. I actually feel really privileged to be in the company of so many amazing women tonight. Some I only know from a distance, like Clara Hackett and Ellie Shroomey, and I think the pandemic has provided a fascinating um, sort of propelling of voices in the sense that Zoom has enabled discussions to take place and for people to be seen and to be heard in a way that hadn't maybe, if you couldn't attend an event, for example, myself, I would be disabled and can't always get the things. So it really enabled me to participate in life in a way that I haven't had in a way. Secondly, I'm fangirling a bit over Deirdre. And I just want to say the ladies question there about how young girls get involved. My daughter got involved in the Belfast Youth Forum and yourself and your sister, your sister oversaw you know, that program and you were a mayor at that stage. And I know that the influence that you had on my daughter in terms of RSE, the activism of the Irish language rights, the standing up for women and, you know, putting your voice out there and not being afraid to be seen and to be heard. And I just really want to thank you for that. But my question is, um, you know, you think of Miriam McCracken as a sort of frail 90-year-old woman or in her 90s and she was still down at the port hot now, leaflets of, the, you know, about abolitionists and, um, you know, to paraphrase a quote about the America's not the land of the, the free and the brave, but the tyrant and the slave. Is there any, um, is, did she ever go to America or was it just her her um, impact with Douglas and the likes of Agriano when they travelled here um, and obviously was it from afar that she she wanted to impact on that or did she ever actually attend America or visit and see it first hand? Just, just for the purposes of, of anyone watching online, uh, Siobhan um, is commenting on, on Marianne's abolitionist um, activism and asking if she ever visited um, America or if it was, a, I suppose, a transatlantic type yeah. of activism and, and, and did she just work locally? I don't know that she herself travelled very much um, at all. But uh, that whole transatlantic influence was everywhere, yeah. um, really, from the 18th century and probably from earlier. Uh, and so many uh, men were exiled over time uh, to there and came back again. The ideas travelled, um, I suppose most particularly after the, the famine years, uh, where there was a great influence coming and going both ways. Um, but also she read a lot. And letters coming and going uh, from America, letters were very important uh, at that time, of course. Uh, so I think all of that is really significant. And that's where I think where her ideas um, were nurtured, um, but she applied them locally. Yeah. And I think that's what's really uh, significant. When we say about thinking, it just brought something to mind, if it's all right. Um, when we talk about that fail old woman, and I don't like showing that yeah. photograph, but it's, it's the one that everybody knows. Um, I remember one time when I was teaching my um, sort of international women's history thing, I brought a, a video in, program on television. Maybe other people saw it, I thought, brilliant. What did your granny do in the war? Yeah. And we all think that our grannies were always, you know, <laughs> white herd and yeah, you know, whatever they were, you know. Boy, it was brilliant, you know, uh, showing what that generation in their youth had been doing and what they thought was important and what some of them didn't really want to have passed on, you yeah. know. Uh, so I think it's really important how we think about people because people were always people the same, yeah. wherever we're looking at them. And I think yeah. we forget that, you yeah. know. But I think it's really relevant when you look at that picture of Marianne that we need to look back to, as most of us are, more radical. Uh, in our youth, some of us got more radical as we got older, but uh, generally speaking, um, it's, it's in our youth uh, that that happens. Um, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. No, absolutely. Folks, I'm, I'm going to... Oh, Claire, do you want to come in there briefly? I'm just well, going to finish up so after briefly, this one. But just to say thank you, and if I was going to have a question, it would be to Dirty to say, I'm so struck by what you said about... Um, Everyone can claim, you know, she was on the right side of history, Marianne McCracken, so everyone can claim her now, and yet how do we, you know, understand her to be the revolutionary activist that she was, and then see her in the people who are doing that, you know, today. But really what I wanted to do, I won't get you to do that again, Kina, but just, I wanted to congratulate you both on such an amazing talk, and how on earth did you just make it 
be so complimentary to each other. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> two, two talks so, uh, that fitted each other so well, but gave such different angles mm -hmm. and ended up something greater than what you both did individually. So yeah. I think I can speak for everybody saying yeah. that. Thank yeah. you. Just a wee question, Myrtle, please. Yeah, no problem. And then we, we are going to finish okay. up. I'm just conscious of the time. Yeah. Just um, out of interest, Myrtle, just think about women in Irish history. You know, if you look back to the like the days of the Ladies' Land League, you always heard about the Parnells. If you talk about the Daughters of Ireland, you always heard about Ma Gone. If you talk about 1916, you always heard about Markovich. And just the work that you have done and other female historians, other women have came to light. I'm just wondering out of curiosity, learn about the time of Mary Ann McCracken. Have you learned any other women? Because I'm sure, for a better word, I'm sure she knocked around with other women <laughs> and, had, and had friends and comrades. I'm just wondering who you unearthed any other that would have been female counterpart and even have you unearthed, I'm not going to be a bit off track, but any other women that might have been involved with the Fenians because there seems to be a gap of women missing there as well. I'm just asking out of curiosity for myself. They're definitely there. Uh, they're definitely there. I say most people involved in all those committees and things in the 19th century, that would have been seen as very typical <coughs> women's work. It was in her leadership of those things that she stood out yeah. and the kind of principles that she brought to them that were different. The issue is in finding those other women it's in what records are left yeah. um, because of, of Clifton House and because of the minutes mm -hmm. uh, of the committees um, they are there. My own work has been much more on 19th century um, <coughs> women and particularly I suppose left leaning uh, women. Um, I know that there's been some work done on the Fenian movement um, but there, there's just so much in there. And we're only at the beginning of it. I think what some of my, my historian colleagues have been doing lately is really in looking at the archives that are just opening up. Um, really, there, there's a massive lot to be found there. And I know that in those minutes, um, uh, in, in all the associations and societies that Marianne was involved in, we should get the names of other women. It's not been my particular remit. Right. John, John Gray, I think, is the expert mm -hmm. uh, on that whole area. He's looked very closely at those archives. Um, but there are so many of these brilliant women. You kind of need a key to get into them. Because when you go into one, then you find out another one. Exactly. And, one mm -hmm. and I was just wondering, was it being done? Because it would be lovely to find out yeah. other women. See, that just that way, PhDs. Women that are left on mention, because you don't want them to leave. You want them yeah. to leave to be left out of history either. What, what's happening with the opening of archives and so forth is it's back in academia with people with the time and the resources and the research yeah. necessity, uh, if you like. Uh, who have the time to do the sort of initial work there, um, who are then bringing it out. Um, you know, you need a name, I suppose, like Parnell and the records around him, uh, having been misinterpreted over many, many years. Um, what I have found is um, at one example of a woman I looked at, Margaret said, uh, after I was widowed and so forth, and I couldn't be annoyed doing anything, and Margaret Ward, it is inspiration and, and colleagues, you know, said to me, for goodness sake, Mer you know, get out and do something, go back to the suffragists. And I thought, Margaret, we've done the suffragists, you know, they're done and dusted. But I went back and I found one woman and I followed her around. And that's, I, I've got a little piece in a book that has just come on, out called The Historian as Detective. So I took her from her suffrage activity to her um, uh, heading, uh, being the first woman in the co-op board, to being a labour councillor, to being a pacifist, to being boom, 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 you know, yeah. and we eventually got a plaque up to her. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's that kind of, you need to have that time. Yeah. And if you don't have it as a young researcher where you have to do it mm -hmm. in academia, well, you can be retired like me. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of ideas in mind. Uh -huh. But it, it takes a lot of time yeah. to find those women. There's never, yeah. I was like, why, why isn't it just an archive? You know, that tell me everything I need to know. It's not like that. So you need a lot of time to do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I know this is 
Uh, sorry, I, I'm just I'm just very conscious of the time, folks, and it's it is the sort of conversation that could go on all night. But hopefully, if you don't mind, ladies, I think we can be hanging about afterwards. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. it's a good bit of a chat. But I'm I'm going to close the discussion there for this evening. Um, I think you've all proven that there are so many more stories to tell, and hopefully we'll uh, be able to facilitate that. And would absolutely love to see everybody back here again. Um, I'm delighted that so many new faces are here. I see some some regular faces, which is brilliant, uh, but so many new faces. Um, but yeah, uh, just just to finish up, thank you, a huge thank you to Deirdre and to Martin for all that they, they did tonight. Um, and just in terms of, of inspiring me, I remember a, a history teacher of mine once telling me um, they always ask why and why why is there no work why is there no stories about women and back in the in the time of the Fenians why is there no stories about and to constantly ask and to query it and to, and to go if you do have the time to find out so um, hopefully there are plenty more stories to be unearthed and we'll, we'll play a part in that but for the same folks Gormila Maiga thank you <laughs>